So today we're going to continue on our Space Explorer client app. And two big features that I want to get done today is going to be server-side rendering as well as infinite scrolling. And the first step that I want to do is create another utility library. And we have already mentioned that we're going to move this code over there. So let's open up the NX console and generate a library. And this time we want a React library and not a Nest.js or a Node library, as this one is going to be specifically just for the client app. And I kind of don't really have a cool name in mind, so it's just going to be called nextlib. And I think I'll pick all the defaults, except I'm going to turn off test and we'll run this generate command. And once again, we have to click CSS. I'm not really sure why, because it should be picking up this, but eh, that's okay. And now we have a new library called nextlib, where it comes with a module CSS. We don't really need this though. But we'll make a new file here for our images utilities, where we're going to copy these two and paste it here. And then also in the index of this library, we need to export everything from that images file. And now back in launch card, we just need to add an import. So we have the updated references to get BG image. And I believe we're also using this in launch details. So we can change this to be instead of from dot, it'll be from space explorer next lib. Okay, so the next step is going to be server side rendering. And what that means for this application is in a side of app, instead of initializing the Apollo client here, we're going to lift it up so that Next.js has access to it on both the server side and the front end or the client side. And to do that, we're going to go back to our next library and make a new file called apollo.ts. And instead of instantiating it in a global variable like this, we're going to create a delayed function so that it can be created dynamically. We still need a global variable to hold the Apollo client so that whenever Next.js initializes, it'll only ever have one instance of the Apollo client. So something like this. Now Apollo client does need some options so that we need to open it up. And the first one and most important for this specific setup is SSR mode or server side rendering mode. And Next.js has a process variable that we can use called process.browser. So now Apollo knows when it's on the server side. We're just saying that there is no browser. Oh, that's odd. Usually when you have the types for Next.js, this should be a valid property. And it turns out I was missing this file, which is the type declaration file to add type references to Next.js. Once you add it to this library, process.browser will work. And then we also have our in-memory cache as before, but there's going to be a slight change here. We want to call restore and provide a variable called initial state. And that's also going to be what we're adding here to the argument of create client. Now this could potentially be undefined. So we'll add the or here and provide an empty object if it is. And what initial state is, is a normalized cache object. So this is a type given to us by Apollo. And what's basically happening here is that if there's already a cache, we're going to restore that cache. So whatever it is at that moment in time, and you can kind of imagine it as we're reinitializing the application state from wherever it was last left off on. And that's what this restore function is. Now earlier we had a URI property, but we're not going to use that. Instead, we're going to have a link property instead. And what that is, is an HTTP link, which also comes from Apollo client. And that's where we'll hold the URI that we had originally, which was to our backend GraphQL server. So localhost 3333. And we're going to add it here. Now, the reason why we need to do this is because we need to provide a fetch. So the way Apollo client works out of the box is that it uses the native browser fetch. But that doesn't work on the server side because Node doesn't have a fetch library. So we'll have to install one that works on both the server and the client, and then replace the default fetch option inside of Apollo. And there's a few of these libraries, but today we're going to use cross fetch. So let's install that. And then we could import it like so. And this is going to be a default import, so no brackets here. But now this link should be able to work on both the server and the client. And then the last thing we need to do just to set all of this up is I'm going to create a hook that will create the client and return the cache or the, the Apollo store. Now this could possibly take in an initial state so that we could send it into the create client. And then we want to make sure that this is only ever called if and only if the initial state changes. So we're going to memoize this using react use memo and providing the dependency array of initial state. 
This is kind of insurance that we will only ever have one instance of Apollo clients. Now with all of that, we can go back to our app.tsx and basically rip out all of this and this and then grab the hook for use Apollo store and I forgot to export this, didn't I? Yeah, I did. So let's make sure we add the exports to our library. So this dot lib slash Apollo. All right, now that is happy inside of our custom app. And this is not happy because of typing because it doesn't know that this is an Apollo store. So we need to add the return type here. So instead of any, this is going to return the type of Apollo clients with the normalized cached object. Oh, I, I know what I did wrong. Forgot to add this. So this needs to be inside of a thunk or a delayed function. Otherwise, we're trying to call it immediately, which is incorrect. Now our app.tsx is happy. And for good measure, let's run this. So nx serve client and the server. And basically, absolutely nothing will change. It's all going to be the same now. And that's because we didn't actually do any server-side rendering. We just set up Apollo so that it can. But for server-side rendering, we actually need to provide an initial state. So where does this come from? And it's going to come from page props. So we'll do page props. And right now, the name of this doesn't matter. It only matters when we actually have to add the initial state to it. So for now, this will be called initial Apollo state. And the page that we actually want to server-side render is going to be the index. So this list of launches, we wanted to render on the server side and then pass the cache to the client afterwards. And to do that, we can use a function called get static props. And Next.js will look for this inside of any of our page components. So we don't have to attach it to the index component like it used to be back in the day. And by back in the day, I mean like six months ago. But, but this will be an async function. And what we want to return is the page props for our original app.tsx. And that's where the name comes in handy. So it has to match the same one that we used inside of app.tsx. So what we'll do here is we're going to create a brand new client. And this create client is the one that we initially created. And then with this Apollo client, we're going to run a query. And this is why it's asynchronous. And the query we want to run is the same one as get launches here. But we're not using it inside of a hook. So we have to specify the raw query itself. Luckily, that was also automatically generated by our code gen or the graphical code gen thing and we'll also need to provide the initial variables so this is patch size dot large now what we provide to initial apollo state is not the client itself we actually want to extract the cache because this is the normalized cache object that is provided as our initial state so a little confusing but just a review of how this works we create a client we run the query and then we send the cache to initial Apollo state, which on app.tsx is run from page props. We grab it and then we initialize the client store. Then we would render the index on the client side. It will know that we already have this data, so it won't have to redo the query. And if everything is working correctly, we if we do a refresh, there won't be a loading. We'll already have all the data. Instead, it'll do the loading on server side, so this might take a while, but now we have everything. Okay, now the next step is to do pagination. So we need to be able to load more than just the initial 10, I believe. Is this 10? Yeah, it's 10. So let's go do that. So for pagination, we're going to need to expand the Apollo.ts a little more than what we already have. The main thing is that we're going to create a thing here called cache options, which currently doesn't exist. But we'll add it up here somewhere. So cost cache options. Right now it's empty. And what this is is the in memory cache config. And this is necessary because we need to define how we're doing pagination. So we need to define a type policy. And this takes place on a query, a query field being launches. Key args is basically a dependency array. So similar to React's use effect defines what property we're watching to change. And right now we have an empty array. So this is basically going to take place on the launches field, no matter what query we're querying. But the property that we actually want to make use of is called merge. 
And I'm going to leave that out for now so that nothing breaks. But we're going to create a number function called merge pagination that we can put inside of that property. Now this is a field merge function with the typing of launch connection. Ugh, fine, I'll add it myself. So this is the type that we created for all the launch connections. And we're going to define the field merge options. So in terms of arguments, this takes in two the existing and incoming. And the responsibility of this function is how we're resolving the two of them when this query is being run. And I think a good refresher on how this schema looks like is to open it up. So incoming and, and existing is in this shape. And the kind of pagination that we're going to do is infinite scrolling. So we want all of them. So it makes sense to just combine the launches together. But for cursor and has more, we always want the most recent, so the incoming properties. Mm -hmm. That way we know when to keep querying or when to stop. So easily, we could spread out the incoming and then only modify the launches property. Now this is going to be a ternary because existing could be undefined. This is This takes place even when the cache is empty, so we need to check if existing exists first. If it doesn't, we'll just put in the incoming launches, but if it does exist, We'll just spread both of them out and the order does matter here. We want the incoming to be lower down on the list. So the newest ones, and that is basically it for merge pagination. So next we just need to go down to cache options and set the merge property to merge pagination. And then all the way down here, we already put in a cache options, so that's good. All right, now we can go into the index file again. And the launch query also has another property here called fetch more. And based on what we already have in the cache options, this will always get the newest version of all the existing data. So to use fetch more, we can send in the same options as a normal query. And the only thing that actually changes is going to be cursor, which we could get from launches.cursor. Now I am not going to do this now because we need to delay it or else the cursor doesn't actually change. And then this is where we're going to do infinite scrolling. So for that to work, we first need a little div here where the only responsibility it has is to load more whenever the user sees it. So the CSS of here is just making sure that it's a little block pretty much. And we need to import the CSS and add this little line. As mentioned before, we just need to be big enough so that it can be seen inside the browser. So the styling doesn't matter. We just need to make sure that it has a definite height. Now we could do some fancy stuff with the intersection observer, which is the native DOM API, but there is a library that can make things a lot easier for us. So we're going to add a library called react use. And this library is basically a collection of all the possible hooks that you can make given the native DOM API. So I'm going to go into our next library and make another file called hooks.ts and make a custom hook to wrap the intersection observer hook that I will call use infinite trigger, which we will use the use intersection from react use. All right, so a couple things I need to import from react. I have no idea why this is mad at me. Weird, but okay. I guess use effects already is global. That is, that sounds weird. So we need the mutable ref object and this is the typing that is received back when you call use ref in react. So that's going to be the first argument. And I don't want to define a div HTML type thing here because kind of confusing how the typing works or how you have to write it. But the first argument is going to be a ref. And the second argument is a callback function or a thunk. And this could be any function. And I will call it a thunk because I want to. So first we need to call use intersection, which takes a ref and some options and this and these options define how much we have to see it on the screen before it triggers and then with the use effect if the intersection is ever equal to one meaning that it's in plain sight of the page we'll invoke the dump and this use effect will run every time the intersection itself changes the intersection ratio because of the threshold we gave it will only ever be zero or one but a triple equals feels safer to me all right, so with the use infinite trigger, let's go back to our index page and we will wrap the fetch more in our use infinite trigger, which I also forgot to add to our 
exports. So yeah, don't don't forget to do this. Kind of important. <laughs> Alright, so we only want to run this fetch more if there's more things to fetch. So that means the cursor has to be true and the property of has more also has to be true. But then in addition to these two properties, we have to make sure that it's not already loading and that fetch more exists. Pretty big if statement. And then finally, we need to provide a ref here. So that will be called the intersection ref. And we will attach it to the load more intersection ref. So that is infinite scrolling. Oh yeah, I have to change this null to the intersection ref. Oh wait, there's one last thing I need to, to add. And that's on the get launches query. We need to add notify on network status change to be true. And all of this property does is that it makes sure that loading is populated correctly on time, whenever it is fetching more. Not quite sure why that's not by default, but all right, now we can test it. So after we refresh, all we have to do is just scroll down forever. So for a brief second, we'll see the little Apollo loading and then it'll just keep going until until there is no more. All right, cool. And with that, I will call it a day. And we're gonna do all the user stuff, so application and booking in the next video. But until then, I hope you found this video valuable and that you enjoyed this video. But in any case, I'll see you all next time.